Hello, I'm Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis, and in this quick video, we're going to talk about valence bond theory. Um, what you see up here, whatever, is a nice little uh, simulator from the fine folks over at FET. There will be a link to this simulator in the description uh, if you want to go play with it yourself. This looks very similar to the um, interaction diagram that was in the 8.2, I'm sorry, 8.1 valence bond theory reading from the chemistry 2E textbook. And I kind of thought that I would talk through this with you uh, here myself. So first off, um, there's a whole bunch going on here. Make it a little easier. We're going to not talk about forces at this particular moment. What we are going to talk about is this energy diagram that we see here. So on our x-axis, it's the distance between our atoms. Um, and what we want to think about here is this in terms of dif the distance between our nuclei. Um, so the nucleus of the orange atom down here and the orange atom down here. Now we've selected oxygen so that we get this nice little graph that's easier to read here. Um, the y-axis is our potential energy diagram. So how much potential energy um, are we saving as we go down or how much potential energy is it costing as we go up? Now, I've said it a million times, Mother Nature is lazy. Really what it means is she just doesn't want to spend energy, which totally makes sense. Um, and so what Mother Nature is going to try to do is position the two atoms such that their energies uh, or that the total energy is saved. So you're not spending much energy. The potential energy is as low as possible on this diagram. So whatever the, and so what I've done here is I've grabbed this atom and you can see on the graph above or I can grab on the graph and I can move it. What you can see is the atoms are getting further apart and where the potential energy on the diagram is, is just basically saying, yeah, we're not really changing the potential energy hardly at all. However, as we get these atoms closer and closer and closer to one another, we start to go down into this potential energy well, and that's favorable because we're saving energy. Um, and we're going to eventually get to a point here where the atoms get close enough so that boom, we're at the bottom of the well. So we would expect by just a pure energy savings point of view, the distance between our two nuclei here would be the preferable distance between, uh, or the preferable you know, distance between the two nuclei. If though we start bringing the nuclei closer and closer together, look how the energy just starts to skyrocket. It goes off the scale. Um, because now we're starting to have uh, we're starting to have forces, specifically the nuclei are getting too close to one another, and so their positive charges are starting to repel against each other. Um, and so that positive charge there um, causes the potential energy to shoot skyward. Mother Nature does not want that. She wants, if at all possible, to have the distance between, the two uh, nuclei such that the potential energy is fitting somewhere nicely in this well. Now, it's really nice to think about atoms as standing still, kind of like how this image is, um, but they don't stand still. They've got, they've got thermal energy. There is energy that is within these. So they are going to be moving back and forth. And if we hit play here, um, very slow, and this is, I know it looks like it's going fast, but it's pretty slow compared to normal speed. Um, we can see that the atom is trying to move, but it's staying within this potential energy well. Um, and that's because when we started it, we said, okay, you're going to be starting from a position that's within the well. You don't have enough energy to move the atoms so that they don't interact with one another you see this like overlap area where the curtain like kind of right near my head where the cursor is this 
overlap area is where the atoms, uh, electron clouds are interacting with one another. This is what we normally think about as that bonding region with respect to Lewis structures and otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, the atoms are moving back and forth and this bonding region is getting a little bit uh, bigger or smaller if you look at the total volume of the thing um, as the nuclei get closer and further apart from one another. So when you're looking at that energy diagram that was there in the book, that's what it's trying to tell you. You get the atoms too close to one another, the potential energy gets too high, you get them too far apart, like we grab this thing and it goes way out here. Um, the atoms don't have any energy or they can't interact with one another, but as you start to get them kind of close, they will interact with one another um, and you save energy in varying degrees as you bring the atoms closer to one another. But at some point in time, they're going to be too close and then it starts costing energy because of columbic interactions. This area in between here is the bonding region that we normally think of with respect to valence bond theory. Now I'm going to bring over the textbook itself um, because I think that they do a fantastic job of showing you all what the various overlaps of atomic orbitals are. So I guess before I do that, I should just really briefly mention here that um, here in this bond energy and length diagram, you hopefully are seeing some trends. Um, so look for bonds that are pretty similar, like a carbon-carbon single bond, a carbon-carbon double bond, or a carbon-carbon triple bond. You can tell that the length decreases, and as length decreases, uh, the bond energy increases. That's a general trend that I hope that you keep track of. Increase those number of bonds, the length of the bonds gets smaller, and the energy increases. Now, down here when it comes to orbital overlap. Right now, and we're going to get to more... Uh, specific and uh, complicated ways of thinking about this. But for right now, this section is trying to get you to just get used to the idea of um, thinking not just in terms of those atoms like we showed on the simulation, right? Because we had the atom represented as just like this ball. What they're trying to say is atoms aren't just balls. They really are these things that have all these atomic orbitals. What happens if the and valence bond theory is saying it's the atomic orbitals, the valence atomic orbitals are the ones that are interacting with one another. So if you have a P orbital, which would be represented here, now the blue and the red uh, represent the phase of the P orbitals, um, and the dot, the black dot there, would represent the nucleus. If you have two different atoms, so this dot, black dot here on the left, the black dot here on the right, um, if you have these two different atoms and you bring them close enough together and if the phase is correct, so they both got to be the exact same phase, you can get this overlap region. And this overlap region is what we would say is the valence bond or the bond. But you got to have the overlap be good and it's gotta so you've got to have um three things really for a bond to happen you have to have the energies of the orbitals uh be similar enough you have to have and we haven't talked about that yet that'll be coming up uh when we talk about molecular orbital theory so you have to have the energy of the orbitals be similar you have to have the uh, shape of the orbitals allowed so that the phase can actually match like we have here in a and like we have here in b it's not overlapping near as much over here in example B, but we still do have this ability for overlap. And finally, your third condition is the atoms have to be close enough for a bond to actually happen, like what we were describing and showed with that simulation. Now, if you have a direct overlap, um, kind of like here in A, B, and C, these are what we normally call sigma bonds. And the sigma really is coming from a symmetry description, which we're not going to really cover in general chemistry one. Um, 
But we think about this direct overlap in this regard uh, as being called a sigma bond. Plainly speaking, when you draw the Lewis structure, the very first bond you ever draw, the single bond, will be a sigma bond. But um, the second bond that you would ever draw is going to be what we call a pi bond. Um, and this pi bond, it looks like you have this direct overlap um, because it's, it is overlapping. But notice how, like in this, these two different p orbitals that we have, um, they're kind of side by side. They're not end on end anymore. They're like kind of going like this to one another. Um, the side by side overlap, that's what we call a pi bond. Um, your second bond, so the double bond in any Lewis structure or a triple bond, the third bond, both the second and the third bond will always be a pi bond. Um, and that's the quick, fast, dirty way to think about that with Lewis structures. So realistically, you can always draw a Lewis structure here. And if you draw the Lewis structure correctly, you can predict how many sigma and how many pi bonds will exist uh, between atoms. So with the HCl that they've got here, there's only the single bond. So it's a sigma bond. Down here with the oxygen molecule, you have a single bond and then you've got a second bond, so a double bond between the two oxygens. The first bond is your sigma bond. The second bond is your pi bond. And then for the nitrogen, you have a sigma and two pi's. So the first bond is always a sigma. The second bond is always a pi. The third bond is always a pi. If you went up to four bonds, you'd have a delta bond. We're not covering that in general chemistry at this point. So knowing that bond structure, you can look at a Lewis structure and something like this, and you can say, oh, I've got two double bonds here. So that means overall, because I have two double bonds, one of each of the double bonds will be a pi bond. Overall, this molecule right here has two pi bonds in it. And that's kind of the gist, and that is, it's not kind of, that is the gist of this section. Um, so being able to, keep track of the sig sigma and pi bonds are the real key things that uh, I want you to be able to do and have an appreciation of what those look like. And we'll cover some more complicated stuff here in the near future. Thanks everybody for watching. Appreciate it. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.